step space time adventure with Sasha Gontra. Peace. All right. Well, um, it's an enormous pleasure and uh, honor for me to uh, be here today. Um, uh, it's a really impossible to overstate the uh, magnitude of impact that uh, Sasha has had on my thinking ever since I started interacting with him a little over uh, 10 years ago, um, both on the course of a really wonderful collaboration that we had in much, much more generally and essentially every aspect of my uh, thinking and, and the subject that I'll be, brought up, I'll be talking about, uh, that I've been thinking about for the past 10, 12 years or so. Um, and it's also crazy uh, that uh, I'm, up, I'm at this uh, meeting. Um, I'm not a mathematical physicist, uh, remotely. Um, I don't know what I am. I guess I'm a normal uh, physicist. Uh, uh, oh, a normal physicist who loves mathematics. I guess it's not the same thing. Um, but uh, I think that's one of the, uh, to me, the most exciting aspects of this uh, broad subject is that it's not sort of esoteric questions about uh, mathematical physics uh, that uh, um, are involved, but really basic things about the physical processes, the most elementary basic physical processes that, that take place in the real world outside our windows. Uh, uh, fundamental and universal aspects of them that we're talking about. And the kind of broad question um, that uh, many of us have been thinking about over the uh, uh, past uh, decade or so or more involves the uh, physics of elementary particle scattering. So you imagine that you throw particles in, elementary particles in, elementary particles are very small. Uh, so uh, when we throw them in from far away, they might as well be coming in from infinity. They bang into each other and they go back out to infinity. Um, uh, the world is quantum mechanical, so we can only predict the probabilities for the outcomes of any particular uh, collision process. And those are given by the squares of the so-called uh, scattering amplitudes. And uh, so we can ask, so what's the, what's the sort of picture we have? So what gives rise to these uh, scattering processes? And the conventional picture is that despite the fact that the experiment starts and ends at infinity in space-time, the particles come into the interior of the space time, they bang into each other in some way, and we're supposed to add up all the possible ways that these interactions could have taken uh, uh, place. Every one of those pictures represents a particular process in space time. So every one of those pictures, the Feynman diagram, is supposed to make the fact that there's a space time of local interactions in space time manifest. And we're supposed to add up all the possible ways that the pictures uh, could have happened, all the possible diagrams in order to make the principles of quantum mechanics manifest. So that's the kind of standard picture is uh, evolution in space-time and evolution in Hilbert space. Those are the two sort of foundational principles of, uh, of uh, 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 fundamental physics. And yet there's lots and lots of indications for a different way of thinking about what's, uh, what's going on here. Uh, and uh, many of us have been trying to ask a sort of different question, a question that's directly posed in the space where the functions live, the space just involving the sort of momentum of the particles that make it out to infinity, uh, the data that you measure at infinity, we're trying to find a question that lives in that space, doesn't live in the interior of space time, doesn't make necessarily any mention of Hilbert space, uh, to which we can discover the amplitudes as the answer. So the answer to a natural new kind of mathematical question that lives in these uh, spaces. Uh, and, uh, and one indication for that is that the standard way of doing things it involves uh, the sum over an exponential number of diagrams, looks horrendously complicated. And yet there's lots of indications that the final answer uh, concretely is vastly simpler than you expect from these uh, enormously complicated intermediate steps. So this picture is deep, it's correct. It describes a world, we're not talking about speculative physics, but somehow making the principles of space, time and quantum mechanics in your face as manifest as possible is hiding something else. It's hiding what's responsible for the great underlying uh, simplicity and hidden infinite symmetries and all kinds of other structures. Uh, now, the, the, the first way that uh, many people run into this uh, simplicity is certainly the, the, and the, uh, and the beginning of the, uh, my interaction with the subject is in the context of yang Lo's theory. Uh, so that's the theory that describes quarks and gluons. Uh, inside the proton, it describes the collisions of protons uh, in cosmic rays of the upper atmosphere. It describes the collisions of protons at the Large Hadron Collider, for example. Um, and uh, uh, and, at, uh, and uh, the most structure of all is understood in the maximally supersymmetric cousin of these theories, which is the Troy model, which uh, doesn't have uh, all the features that the full realistic theory has. But as Troy models go, I want to emphasize 
the leading order of the amplitudes in this theory are, are identical. Uh, and many of the most complicated parts of the amplitudes of the real theory are actually shared by this point model. So it's not a terrible point model as point models go. And, uh, and here, there's a whole story that uh, 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 began uh, when I learned from Sasha about ideas of total positivity in the positive Grassmannian um, that later developed into the story of the amplitohedron. We will not be speaking about today. And ironically, these are somewhat a lot more sophisticated. Uh, the structures involved are more, they're somewhat more novel. Um, uh, they're not even very well understood purely uh, mathematically. And the whole time at the very start, I sort of hoped that there would be some way of seeing some story like this and a completely vanilla kind of theory, just a theory of scalar, non supersymmetric in any number of dimensions. Uh, and here, too, I got a very early clue from Sasha, who told me about the isosahedron, uh, something very well known to mathematicians that I certainly had never heard of. And that, that uh, sort of stuck in my mind for a long time that somehow we should try to relate the isosahedron, these much simpler polytopal geometries, to uh, the physics of uh, scattering amplitudes. And ironically, that took a, longer, a lot longer to do, even though the ideas involved are fundamentally simpler. There are a number of little technical obstacles involved that uh, had to be overcome. And, uh, but I think now, now we, we understand a lot better uh, how this works. And that's part of what I wanna uh, be uh, telling you about today. So, um, so we're, we're going to be talking about totally vanilla theories um, uh, and uh, a theory whose uh, Lagrangian would be given by trace d phi squared plus some coupling constant d phi, uh, uh, phi cubed. Uh, but very importantly, these scalars have color. So they have, uh, 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 two indices uh, ij, so that this basic interaction is associated with uh, 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 a picture like this. Um, and so, uh, so it's colored. So we think of these. Uh, now, this is a toy model for Yang Mills theory. Uh, Yang Mills theory is exactly the same uh, properties. Except that in its interactions, there's also interesting numerator factors. There are dependences on momenta, the spins of the particles, and so on. And today we'll be ignoring all of that. So, what we're talking about is this toy theory, but this toy theory has some universal properties and it has the universal singularities that every amplitude in any theory has. Okay, uh, any color theory, okay, any color theory kind of singularities that such amplitudes have are shared by this theory. The only difference is that there's interesting numerators and if there's a negative time left at the end, I'll say some speculation about what we might learn about numerators. Anyway, so uh, since uh, the 1970s in physics and earlier in mathematics, we know that these pictures, so if we look at the Feynman diagrams, so this is what a Feynman diagram at tree level would look like. Uh, uh, for example, for four point scattering, we draw these uh, two uh, diagrams, um, or we could draw. A loop, so on. So we know that these pictures are, are really associated with surfaces, and we can think of them as triangulations of surface. So if I draw this, that was five points. So physics goes back to a, a, a tuft. So if I take a triangulation of a surface, this triangulation is dual to one of these uh, uh, diagrams, and we can really think of the diagrams as uh, defining uh, one such uh, uh, triangulation. Okay, so that's uh, the standard picture of uh, ribbon graphs dual to a triangulation. Okay, and just to stress that just a, you can think of a single Feynman diagram, a single Feynman diagram, each vertex is associated with the triangle of the triangulation. And the way that the vertices are glued together in the diagram tells you how the uh, triangles are are identified in order to define the triangulation. And we, we're assuming the surfaces are oriented. Yes. Sorry, no, we're not in six dimensions. We're not in six dimensions. We're in any number of dimensions. Okay. Um, okay. And of course, a single Feynman diagram uh, defines the surface, if you like, just by specifying a particular triangulation. Okay, so I like to slide back and forth between drawing these uh, 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 ribbon graphs and just a triangulation of a surface. But just to say one last uh, 
thing uh, how do we identify the sort of kinematic variables so if we're drawing Feynman diagrams we would say there's some momentum p1 p2 p3 p4 so there would be some momentum p1 plus p2 associated with this propagator and so on so the variables are kinematic variables our kinematic variables uh, for reasons I, I won't explain now are really associated with homotopy classes of arcs on the surface. But with every with every variable, we associate some uh, momentum or propagator or really a momentum squared by the homology associated with that guy, where we imagine that there is momentum associated with the external segment. So, uh, so in this case, there's, there's only one uh, boundary, but uh, the momentum associated with this arc X or the momentum squared associated with that arc X, well, X is uh, homologous to uh, the, the sum of these three segments. So this would be P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared. And I'm gonna associate a variable X with every arc. And I'll uh, go back and forth. Uh, when I write a capital X, I'm talking about this invariant associated with it. Which would be the momentum p sub x squared minus m squared, where m squared is the mass of the particles. Notice that uh, this there is a distinction between the the the, the non-boundary chords and the boundary chords. In this case, uh, p one uh, p one squared p one squared is just equal to the m squared, the mass of the particles. So the boundary guys are frozen, uh, uh, as familiar in many contexts. They they don't vary. They they're part of what specifies the data of the problem, the masses of the external particles, they can all be different if you like, but uh, for simplicity, I'll just assume uh, they're all the same. Okay, so that's our kinematic space. So our, our kinematic space is, if we wanna uh, talk about Feynman diagrams of some order in this uh, topological genus expansion, uh, the space that where the amplitudes live is a function of the, uh, the homotopy class of arcs on the surface and each arc is associated with this a number associated with external data. Uh, eventually, for example, if, if I draw an annulus, uh, I'll have a situation where there are some homotopy class of arcs that are not homologous to the boundary, like that one. Okay, and so that would be associated with an unknown uh, momentum. So that, that's what we call a loop momentum L. Uh, and so these are dual to diagrams that would look something like this. They would have a loop. Something like that. Uh, so they would have uh, they would have a closed loop uh, where the momentum is is unknown, and that's fine. You just give it a name. You pick a basis for the homology. You give it a name, and that determines all the momenta everywhere else. And then what we should do the loop diagrams is integrate over the loop momenta. Okay. So so that's our kinematic space. And in this kinematic space, we'd like to ask a question whose answer is the sum over all the Feynman diagrams. Um, and the sum over all the Feynman diagrams is the sum over all the triangulations of the surface. And each triangulation is weighted with the product of one over all these uh, X variables, uh, these capital X variables uh, associated with each, uh, with each uh, chord. Okay, so there's various technicalities. Uh, uh, there's infinitely many of these variables. Uh, uh, you don't think you draw infinitely many Feynman diagrams. Don't worry about all that. We won't. Uh, uh, Talk, talk about that. It's really most natural to think about this infinite object, which gives you infinitely many copies of all the Feynman diagrams that are related by the action of the Mathman class group. And that's something that we'll deal with at the very end. So, so, so I won't even talk about it uh, uh, today. Okay, so, uh, so now we, have our, our, we, we are posing our problem. And so the question is, uh, why should we consider all the triangulations of the surface? Hey, what, why do triangulations of the surface matter? All of them. You need one of them to define the surface. Why do we care about all the triangulations of the surface? That's the question. Why do we care about processes in space time? Because every triangulation of the surface corresponds to some Feynman diagram that corresponds to some process in space time. Why do I care to generate all the processes in space time? Question one. Question two, why should I add them all up coherently? You sort of wait one. Hey, that's quantum mechanics, right? So why do we have processes in space time? Why do we have quantum mechanics is now, what kind of question do we ask? What structure in the space asks us to produce all triangulations of the surface and to add them all coherently? Okay, that's the very beginning of our uh, adventures here. 
And we're going to see the answer to this question is really lying in plain sight. When we just begin to responsibly think about uh, how to just label the curves on the surface. And many of these things are very well known to the, uh, the beginning part of the story certainly is, is very well known to all the uh, uh, experts on this business in the audience. But I want to describe it in as maximally elementary way as possible in a way that uh, someone in junior high school could understand. Uh, and that's re it's really true. The, uh, my, uh, at least my own involvement in this business has been in making things more and more elementary. And the story of the positive Rasmanian, you have to be in high school. You need to know what a determinant is. Now you don't even have to be in high school. You know, we're not even going to talk about determinants. We're just going to talk about adding vectors. Okay? Not, not much else other than adding vectors. Okay, so, so, so that's what we're going to see. Is, uh, um, uh, but uh, this understanding is, is going to give us a number. Uh, it, it has some teeth. It's going to give us a number of new and much more efficient ways of actually computing the amplitude. Um, with no reference to the diagrams at all. I've written a few examples there purely impressionistically. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, refer to them later. Um, and these expose certain hidden, uh, hidden symmetries uh, along the way. I might not have time to talk about the hidden symmetries uh, today, but uh, I might briefly uh, refer to them. And finally, uh, this picture that fundamentally begins with particles. We're just starting from this theory of colored particles. Uh, and the surface just emerges just you know, as the combinatoric of uh, capturing the combinatorics of drawing diagrams, um, we're going to see that uh, this, uh, the picture that, that we're, we're going to be talking about, it hands us uh, on a platter the generalization from particles to quote unquote strings. So the generalization for particle amplitudes to quote unquote uh, uh, string amplitudes in a way that never talks about a world sheet, never talks about a conformal field theory, does not involve 200 pages of a string theory textbook in order to get the final answer for what the actual amplitudes look like. Okay? We'll see that it just, once we see what this picture of particles is about, we'll almost instantly have, a, have, a, have a, the concrete formulas for what the string amplitudes look like. But the word strings here was in quotes. Why was it in quotes? Because, you know, string theory lives in 26 dimensions and has very specific spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're really getting from this picture is a set of quote unquote amplitudes that don't have any of those restrictions. Okay? They work for any particle and any number of dimensions, any masses. They capture certain universal properties that string amplitudes are supposed to have. The factorization of amplitudes being uh, related to the pinching of surfaces. All of that has nothing to do with the strings of string theory. It's really some very basic fact about, uh, well, the things that I'm gonna be talking about. But of course, there's a very special corner in this set of theories where the year 11, 26 dimensions and the mass is correct and, and the rest of it happens that corresponds to real string theory. And we can actually identify sort of even intrinsically from this point of view, what the, at least the beginnings of what's special that happens at that point. And there's many more magical things that happen there that come with both good and bad things. There's lots of extra magic. They're also more further removed from the real world. Okay, so on the other hand, some of the basic ideas are about anything. And we can, it has nothing to do with a particular spectrum of strength theory, nothing to do with 26 dimensions. Um, and uh, is a, just a much more general way of talking about uh, uh, particle scattering. Now, uh, the ideas of uh, Fock and Gontorov, uh, which Sasha was telling me about uh, from, from our very earliest uh, uh, interactions and sounded totally amazing to me, are both conceptually and practically central to this story. Um, although what I'm going to uh, do in this talk is emphasize a particular point of view um, uh, and a very useful set of uh, variables um, uh, that's, I think, both of intrinsic interest and crucial for, uh, uh, for correctly um, tying to the physics. And as we'll see, uh, the most general setting uh, for these ideas, uh, we know that, uh, that, that, that uh, there's a cluster structure associated with surfaces, but uh, the most general setting uh, for these things it can be phrased in culture algebraic terms, but it's really not most natural, for little detailed reasons, it's not most naturally phrased in culture algebraic terms, but it's most naturally phrased in the language of uh, quiver representation theory. And, um, and I probably won't say anything about quiver representation theory, but at least towards the end of the talk, I'll give you the, the, an idea of what the sort of, uh, what, what, the, what the basic point is, that the objects that we're going to encounter are counting something. They're, they're, they're very basic combinatorial objects and uh, I will uh, give you an indication rather than sort of more geometric ones associated with hyperbolic geometry. And uh, I will at least give you some idea of what, what that's about. All right, so, uh, so let me say in a little more detail, but I'm gonna, 
what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there are really three things, but probably for the sake of time, I'll talk about uh, two of them. One is extremely elementary. And again, known to uh, uh, in many guises, uh, it's long understood by many experts uh, in the audience. But from just thinking about uh, labeling uh, curves on the surface, uh, we get a fan, we get a geometric or a G vector fan. Uh, and I'm going to have as a running example uh, for most of the talk uh, the very simple case of uh, uh, five particles on a disk. That's the tree amplitudes for five particles, but I'll indicate. Uh, uh, when and how uh, things generalize to all surfaces. The story, of course, generalizes uh, to, all, to all surfaces. Um, uh, um, so, this is, so this is kind of a tropical picture. Um, then there's a, there's a polytopal picture that I'll probably not spend too much time talking about, but kind of generalizing the uh, isosahedron. So uh, just like the isosahedron can be thought of, as capturing the facets of the association can be thought of as capturing the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, combinatorics of triangulations of a polygon, and in particular, going to the facets of the association correspond to pinching pinching a curve on on the disk and splitting the disk in two. That idea generalizes all surfaces in an interesting way. It's interesting because uh, general surfaces have infinitely many curves. These uh, polytopes are, have an interesting fractal structure. They have infinitely many facets, but they capture again in exactly the same way the cutting, uh, the the uh, the properties of the surface under pinching curves, is captured by the facet structure of these polytopes, uh, including the interesting closed curves on the uh, uh, surface as well. Okay, so so in this case, uh, uh, it's a very particular. Uh, polytope, the normal vectors of the facets of this polytope are just associated with the, uh, the vectors in the fan. And finally, there's a nonlinear version of the story, what we call binary geometry. And uh, if you think about what, what's going on uh, in this, uh, what's going on uh, with the shape, uh, there are some sort of faces that are being kept apart from each other. Okay? So there are some facets that are being kept apart from each other. The facets that are being kept apart from each other correspond to curves on the surface, in this case, uh, just on the disk with five points that, that, that are crossing. And so there's some notion of curves that are compatible and that are incompatible. And what this polytope is doing is saying that the curves that cross are being kept apart. Okay? And uh, there's a sort of a totalitarian principle that everything that's not, uh, that's not forbidden is mandatory. <laughs> So that all the guys that can come together do come together in, uh, in uh, vertices. Okay? So the guys that uh, are incompatible are kept apart, and every everything else which is allowed does actually uh, exist. Okay, so that's uh, so that's something kind of in a linear uh, polytopal world, but there's a curvy version of this. There's a nonlinear version of this that is associated for any surface with the following lovely equation. We associate with every arc x. A variable u sub x, and uh, and write down the following equation: that u sub x plus the product over all the other curves y, u sub y to the power of the intersection number, just the geometric intersection number, the number of terms, the the number of times the curves x and y cross on the surface equals one. Okay. These are a very nonlinear set of uh, equations, and very naively, even in this simple case, uh, we would have sort of five. Uh, five curves on the surface. We'd have five equations, five variables. Naively, these equations would just have solutions in points, but they don't have solutions in points. They have a two-dimensional space of solutions. In general, they have a space of solutions which is the same as the dimension of the Tychmuller space of the surface. But what's interesting about this sort of uh, way of thinking about the surface is that if you say the word positivity, that we're very happy to do as usual. So if we demand that all these variables are positive, then these equations also tell us that they're all less than one as well. And then these have a quite lovely property that if a given variable, a u sub x goes to zero. So if it's hitting its boundary at zero, then because of this equation, all of the variables that cross it 
for which this exponent are non-zero, all the incompatible variables across it must go to one. So that's why we call this a binary realization of the uh, combinatorics of compatibility. That's why we call it a binary geometry. So you see, these polytopes just kind of keep the faces apart that don't meet. But it's not unique. You can, you can move these things around a little and still have the same, uh, same, same property. This is a much more rigid thing. Okay? So when some variables go to zero, the incompatible variables go to one. And, yes. Yes. Can you linearize somewhere? Oh, so 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 yeah, and and, and indeed, there are two. There, there are sort of three ways of trying to solve these uh, equations and see these properties. One of them is to try to solve them directly, which is not that easy. But there are two other ways that we know of doing it. One that connects to hyperbolic geometry and explicitly the fact of algebra and uh, uh, and uh, some, there's an explicit formula for these u's as uh, very simple cross ratios that are ultimately nicely ex expressed as ratios of polynomials in x coordinates uh, but there's another way of uh, of solving them is associated with quiver representation theory Uh, and uh, and I won't again. I won't say explicitly what this is, but I'll give you a, a, a flavor of what this kind of uh, computation looks like. Uh, it's this thing that uh, allows you to uh, that that can realize this kind of binary equation in a much more general setting that doesn't have anything per se to do with surfaces uh, uh, necessarily. Okay? So, um, and we're still trying to figure out the sort of largest setting in which equations like this make sense. But as we'll see, every time we have equations like this. There's a kind of particle amplitude and a string amplitude, quote unquote, that's associated with them that has all the same qualitative properties that we associate with ordinary particle and string amplitudes for uh, uh, surfaces. Yes. Can I clarify correctly? Yes. What is the product over and what variables over? Oh, it's, it's all the arcs on the surface. If you see, take any surface, you, it's really the product over all the laminations. I'll, I'll, I'll say it a little more explicitly. So for every lamination on the surface, there's a variable u sub x. Sorry? It's a surface with boundary. And it's a surface with boundary. That's right. It, that's right. Uh, and so, right. So, so these are, uh, uh, if I'm a little more, uh, if I said a little more explicitly, these are either, uh, these equations literally is written are either for boundary to boundary or boundary to uh, puncture. Okay. So they, they've included the case of spiraling variables. There's also u's associated with closed curves as well. And I will say something about them. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm going to illustrate the main ideas with uh, uh, A2. But let's start from the let's start from this story that we can explain to a, a kid in junior high school. So uh, so let's uh, take this example. So I'm going to draw. So there's my ribbon graph. There's the triangulation associated with it. And, uh, and now I want to think about how we would talk about curves on the surface. Now, uh, an important uh, point here. So, I mean, obviously, the most obvious way to specify a curve on the surface, just draw a curve on the surface. And, and so I'm giving a triangulation. So this is the triangulation associated with the surface. Surface. The most obvious way to define it is just to uh, uh, draw the curve and say which one of the chords of the triangulation it intersects. Okay. So that's just uh, the uh, 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 what you call the geometric vector of the curve. Um, but it's a little ambiguous if you think about what's happening if we really draw the, the chords from point to point. It's more natural to draw laminations where instead of drawing one four, or let's say two five, we imagine pushing the endpoints a little according to the orientation of the surface. I'm going to push them to the right here. Uh, so instead of drawing two five like that, I will draw this curve instead. Okay. And that's actually very natural from the perspective of the ribbon graph, because these curves just correspond to taking a walk in the graph. Okay, so uh, so this uh, two five would just be this curve, just sort of taking a walk on the road uh, of this graph. Okay, so uh, having done that, now let's say you just want to tell someone how to take how to go for a walk in the graph. Well, we know how we do it. You put it in Google Navigate, and Google Navigate tells you uh, what to do, right? So 
what is this? What is this walk? Well, I start in road one, two. Sorry, I start in the road two, three. And then uh, I make a right turn onto road one, three. I'm going to denote a right turn by going down and a left turn by going up. Okay, so uh, so uh, so here I'm doing a, a yeah sorry so here I, I took a I took a a, a a left turn onto road one three and then I take a right turn onto road one four and a right turn onto road five one. Okay, so that's what I would associate. That's what I would associate it with the with the two five. And similarly, uh, let, let me just uh, do uh, all of them. So here's, uh, so that would be one three. One four. Sorry, it's a mess here. That would be two four. Two five we did, and three five would be a. Uh, Uh, and we also have uh, we also have the other roads. I could take, for example, the road one two uh, would be one two to two three, and so on. Just the, another sample: five one would be five one, uh, one four, one three, one two, and so on. Okay. So every curve is kind of a word like this. Every curve is a word with going this road left, that road right, left right, and everything we see. Just corresponds to roads, uh, and the roads are just the arcs of the triangulation. Okay? So everything that we see just corresponds to arcs of the triangulation. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. One to five supposed to go The arc. Which, sorry. Which? With the dance line going from one to five. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. About that. Thank you. Okay. Now, as I said, the most basic thing that you can do is just record. Uh, uh, you know, here we have uh, we have uh, we have seven arcs, five on the boundary. Sorry, seven chords, five on the boundary, uh, the two uh, internal guys. So every one of these guys is some seven-dimensional vector in this space. Okay, we have a total of ten variables, so we can express these ten variables on a basis of any seven of them in this in, in this space. It's very natural to choose a basis. Uh, for uh, for these variables to be these geometric vectors that are associated with the boundary, as well as the geometric vectors associated with the chords of the triangulation one three and one four. Okay, so once you do that, we can of course get all of the other. Uh, we can of course write all the other vectors as a linear combination in this way. So, for instance. Uh, let me just uh, give them name for L for lamination. Lamination for T4 is what it is for 1, 4 minus 1, 3 plus L, 2, 3. L for 2, 5, you can just very easily. L for 3, 5 is minus L for 1, 4 plus L for 3, 4 uh, plus L for 5, 1. Okay, so. Uh, and let me separate these guys here. So I've separated into the guys that depend on the internal triangulation. L's are the ones that correspond to the boundaries. Now, so far, these are just a bunch of boring vectors. I have 10 vectors. They all have positive integer entries. They're all sort of obviously pointed. They all have plus signs. Nothing very exciting has happened. <laughs> but we know there's some distinction between the outer guys, the boundary guys, and the inner ones. The outer guys are frozen, the inner ones aren't. So it makes sense to project through the outer guys. So what we're gonna do is take this seven dimensional project, uh, picture and project through the five directions of the outer guys. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that we're just gonna, in the projected picture is gonna be two dimensional and we're just gonna set all these things to zero in the projected picture. So now I'm gonna have a two dimensional picture and let me choose as a natural basis. I mean, uh, I have the directions corresponding to uh, one three, L one three, and L one four. And now let's see, L two four 
is this vector, and we get those of you who know everyone's favorite band, L24, L25, and L35. Okay. So just taking the geometric vectors and projecting through the boundary, which is the sort of uh, geometric analog of going on shell, forcing the saying that the external momenta don't matter, they're fixed. Uh, Okay, uh, now gives us a more interesting picture. And now here's the remarkable thing, which in this picture is still pretty small, but it's already pretty striking. First of all, we get a we get a complete band. These vectors cover the whole space. But secondly, the cones that we see are interesting. So who are these guys? One three and one four. Well, these are two compatible cones. Okay. They describe a triangulation of the surface. So do these guys. So this describes another triangulation of uh, uh, the uh, surface, 2, 4, and 1, 4, and so on. So in other words, every one of these cones is associated with one of the Feynman diagrams, okay, one of the triangulations, one of the Feynman diagrams. This is pretty amazing. I mean, this is a very small example, but it's, uh, but it's true here. It's true for all surfaces that just the simple act of taking the geometric vectors and projecting through the boundary gives us a picture of a fan that covers the entire space. And the, the cones of the fan are exactly those uh, arcs that come together in triangulation of the surface as Feynman diagrams. So remember, that's what we were after. Why do we care about all the Feynman diagrams? And why should we all add them all together coherently? And just the picture of labeling the curves on the surface viewed in the appropriate way, literally viewed in the appropriate way by projection, tells us that, that uh, that's a natural thing to do. We have all of the triangulations together, and somehow they should be taken all together, and, uh, and they fit together in some way. So I don't have time to describe this in more detail, but one of the things that this picture makes, uh, 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 one of this picture tells you is that you're not supposed to think about the diagrams as just sort of random disconnected things that you add up together. There are some diagrams that touch, they're close, and they're far. Okay? So there's some notion of, uh, of them being uh, uh, close and far. Uh, when we go to more uh, general uh, situations, uh, this, this fan is a lot more interesting. Again, the moment we go beyond the really simplest example, like we talked about the annulus, we talked about this, uh, we talked about this surface. Now, already there's infinitely many arcs that we can draw on the surface, and the fan looks. Uh, more interesting. So again, each one of these is uh, each one of these cones is some triangulation to the surface, but but uh, but they accumulate they accumulate on this uh, 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 special point, and that special point is actually the vector that you would get associated with this closed loop on the surface. So closed loops have an interesting uh, role to play in this story, and the fact that these uh, but the fact that these cones fit together in some way actually implies the symmetry of the amplitude that I don't have time to uh, time to uh, uh, explain. There's naturally, uh, it's natural thing about the amplitude of the differential form. And the fact that the cones all fit together implies a sort of a hidden symmetry of this form that's not obvious if you think just in terms of adding Feynman diagrams, but becomes obvious when you have this fact. Okay, but uh, so this is the sort of beginning of the, the very beginning of the of this story. But now you see, now that we have, uh, now that we know we have this picture of, uh, of a fan, there's something that you might be tempted to do. So um, given that all the diagrams fit together in this space, uh, you might be tempted to try to sort of combine all the diagrams together into a single object in some nice way. So let me go back to this picture. And uh, so uh, you might be tempted to, to find the following kind of function. So I want to find a function. I'll call it minus u x for any uh, of the arcs uh, x on the surface. And I want this function to be piecewise linear. Well, see why it can't be linear everywhere. Uh, but I want it to be piecewise linear. So I want it to be linear on each one of these uh, cones. But I want it to have the following property that it lights up one ray at a time. Okay, so I want to define this new theta max such that 
minus u sub x evaluated on the ray for direction y is equal to delta x y. Okay. Suppose I could find such a function. That's kind of a natural question. I want to find some piecewise linear function that lights up one ray uh, at a time. Suppose I could do such a thing. Then there's a kind of a very nice formula for the whole amplitude that I could write down, not as summing over Feynman diagrams explicitly, but just one integral over the whole space in which that band lives. Okay, so I could write down this uh, formula. I would say that the amplitude in this example is the integral minus infinity to infinity over the whole space dt1 dt2. So these, these use of x would be a function of t1 and t2, function on the space. But I would write it as e uh, to the uh, some parameter alpha prime, the string theorists would call the shrink length squared, but it, it's going to be play a trivial role in the subject uh, uh, here, times this kinematic variable x. Remember, this was a piece of x squared minus m squared, the propagator. Times use of x. Okay. So why does this do the desired thing? The point is just that in every region, in every one of these regions, that exponential, for example, in this region, if I look at the contribution from that region, then in, then any point in this region, any point p in this region, p1, p2. Any t1, t2 is alpha times some positive alpha times this vector plus another positive alpha times that vector. And by definition of what these uh, uh, use of x's are, sorry, this is sum over x. By definition of what they are, in, in this region, this would just be integral of the alpha d beta, even the minus. Uh, Alpha for x14 plus beta for x24, uh, and with an, uh, sorry, with an alpha prime out front. And this was just going to be one of the alpha prime squared times the product of the x. So I can get rid of that alpha prime squared just by putting an alpha prime squared in front of the whole thing. And then where we just get this. So you see, the, the independent of this alpha prime is just trivial. It just scales out of the of the uh, uh, whole problem. Uh, this is what the physicists would call Schwinger parameterization, Schwinger or Feynman parameterization. So the idea that for any given diagram you can represent the propagators as the e, the integral of e to the minus alpha x is trivial. That's a very useful thing to do when you want to evaluate loop diagrams. Uh, you represent them that way. Then we do the loop integrals, loop integrals are Gaussian. So this is a very useful idea. But typically, it's done for every graph at a time. This graph, that graph, that graph. Each one has its own private uh, Schwinger parameterization. The point of this fan, of this complete fan, is it becomes possible to imagine that there's a unified Schwinger parameterization. Okay? There is one set of, there's one two dimensional space, but with all the uh, all the Schwinger parameters for all the propagators in there, but they're piecewise linear functions that turn on to give you exactly what you want in each column. Okay. So if we could do that, if we could find these sort of uh, nice piecewise linear functions, then uh, we would have an interesting unified form. And I'm going to define, let me just define a variable. Here. Let me try to define a variable u sub x, which is just e to the little u sub x. Then the formula I'm saying is that this amplitude, this is just the, 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 the field theory amplitude, is the integral of d squared t, alpha prime squared d squared t, just the product over all the x's of u sub x to the alpha prime. The premise on alpha prime here is just trivial. It just factors out. Okay, and uh, this is uh, from this very simple example at tree level. When we do this at loop level, it also trivializes doing a loop integration. We can do the loop integrals as Gaussian integrals, and we get certain polynomials 
uh, and these little uh, use of x variables that are associated with surfaces uh, in general. But naively, finding these practical functions, uh, sorry, finding these piecewise linear functions that light up one ray at a time is just as hard as enumerating all the Feynman diagrams. After all, you have to find, uh, this is equivalent to saying, if you give me a random vector of the space, how do I decide which cone it's in? Okay, so very naively, you have to just look around, see what all the cones are and decide which cone it's in. So naively, this problem is just as hard as enumerating all the Feynman diagrams. Despite the fact that we've uh, given it this uh, seemingly more unified form, there's uh, nothing especially simple going on. In fact, you could take a strategy like this for a random fan, not just one that looks like this. You could move the, the you could move these rays around a little bit. You could say all the same words for sort of a random fan uh, like this, and nothing good would happen. So there's something extra nice which happens associated with this fan. And the extra nice thing is the following. Uh, this fan is naturally made out of simple pieces. Okay. So if we look at uh, this fan, um, it's naturally made up of three simple pieces. In other words, it's sort of common refinement of this fan, of this fan, and of that fan. So if I put those three pictures on top of each other, uh, that gives me uh, the fan that I uh, started with. Um, now, yeah. Sorry? yeah, that's true. But if I just draw the pictures on top of each other, I get this. Do we need to put a thing? No, no. You don't have the right No, no. I just have I just have these 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 three. Now, uh, each one of these is uh, so like this this fan. I can associate with a piecewise linear function. Uh, it's a piecewise linear function which is whose domains of linearity are just associated with the picture. So what is it in this case? It's just a, for example, this would be max of zero and minus T2. And this, the max is T2 here and is zero there. This would be max of zero and minus T1. Uh, the max would be uh, negative T1 here and zero there. And this is slightly more interesting. It's a max of zero minus T2 and minus T2 minus T1. And this guy is zero here, minus T2 here, and minus T2 minus T1 here. Okay, so let me give these names. I don't know. I'll call this the F3, F1, and F2. Okay, so we have sort of, so in other words, if you give me these three functions and ask what's the domain of linearity of all three functions together, it's just this whole cone. And already there's something, this is a tiny example, but slightly cool because there's five cones here and only three linear functions. Okay, so there's fewer, uh, fewer piecewise linear functions than, than, than there are cones. Now, we wanted to find these functions that light up one ray at a time. There's five rays. So, but I can now clearly do it just by counting equations on unknown because I have these three piecewise linear functions together with the two linear functions, just T1 and T2. So I'm going to take linear combinations of these five piecewise linear functions, which have the properties that they light up one ray at a time. Okay. And so you can just do it. Just uh, find what a linear combination of these three guys, as well as T1 and T2, light up one ray at a time. And what you get is uh, so this little u for one three is negative t one negative f one. The little u for one four is some concrete of trivial linear algebra to uh, uh So I've now, I've now uh, expressed, I've now found how to light up each ray, but with less information than all the five cones. With only three, uh, with, with only three functions, I've managed to uh, uh, light up all each ray uh, at a time. Okay. Now this extends. Uh, so, for example, what happens just on the disk at n points? At n points on on the disk. 
the only functions that you need are these f i j, the max of zero, negative t j, negative t j uh, plus t j minus one. Okay, just consecutive guys like this, just like we saw in this example. So, and then the formula for the generic u i j is there's something exceptional that happens uh, uh, for the uh, uh, close to the uh, initial triangulation, but the sort of generic formula looks like uh, just a linear combination of, uh, of four of these guys. But now it's much more dramatic because here there are Catalan number order of cones, uh, which is the order four to the n at large n, but there's only order n squared of these uh, f. So this really is something remarkable that I'm, I can sort of generate all of these exponentially many different triangulations and diagrams from a very small polynomial number of uh, building blocks. Okay. Now, that means that I can now take that information and shove it into that general formula that I told you for the amplitude. And that gives you very concrete formulas for the scattering amplitude. And I've written two of them down there. Okay, you don't need to look at them in any detail. But I've written the tree amplitudes and the one loop amplitudes in any number of dimensions uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, theory. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I can start the loop level, we've done the loop integration. So these aren't the sort of integrands. This is the final expression. If you actually evaluate that integral, you get a sum of a bunch of polylogarithms. Okay. So but the point is there's no Feynman diagrams in sight. There's not a sum over pieces. Instead, what we get, uh, this is just trivially after doing the exponential integrations and the Gaussian integrations at loop level, is we get a function uh, that depends on uh, uh, these uh, interesting piecewise linear expressions. These the tropical expressions, the main star of which is that Fij, which is the same object that I wrote before. So you see this both at tree level and at loop level. Okay? These are formulas for this trace cube theory. Again, no mention of any Feynman diagrams, and sorry, they're, inter they're integrals over just the n minus four unit sphere uh, for a tree level and the n minus one unit sphere at uh, uh, one loop. That's the dimension of the corresponding Pagnolo space minus one. Okay. Um, now, uh, 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 how long do I have? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, so, um, so uh, let me just say that uh, this picture of a fan is actually the normal fan of a polytope. Okay, so in, in general, of course, in this case, it's a normal fan of the isosahedron, uh, but uh, but in general, it's a normal fan of uh, of a uh, polytope. Maybe the only thing I'll say about this polytope in general is a familiar feature of this uh, business is that the 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 as we saw uh, in, in the example the, these uh, these uh, vectors accumulate uh, to the direction of the Vectors associated with closed curves; those look like kind of lower dimension, uh, living in a, a lower dimension uh, uh, spaces in this fan. But in the polytope, everything is blown up into being its. You know that that there's a facet associated with that direction that's just as good as all the other facets of the uh, of the polytope. And the connection to the polytope makes this the, the the way to think about the polytope and to construct the polytope makes the fact that the fan is built out of these simple pieces obvious. Because these polytopes are naturally Minkowski sums. The polytopes are naturally Minkowski sums of simple pieces, and uh, and the the kind of uh, the uh, the the fans uh, the the normal fans associated with the Newton polytopes of the of the simple pieces are exactly the, what we see in the in the common in, in, in these uh, refinements that give us uh, the whole fan. All right, but given that I only have uh, five minutes. Let me just say um, something about uh, uh, how do we go from here? So, so um, let's say we now look at one of these expressions. Zero minus two, two minus two minus two one. Well, uh, this is very clearly and naturally associated. With the following function, 
via uh, tropicalization. So what that means is if I put all the xi equal to e to the minus pi, then as uh, uh, as p goes to infinity, e, this goes to e to the that. It just different monomials dominate. Which monomial dominates as we go off to infinity controlled uh, is controlled by exactly the max of those uh, of the exponents. And uh, this is one definition of what we achieve by the tropicalization of this polynomial F2. Okay, and so uh, so this sort of piecewise linear expression is very naturally associated with this nonlinear polynomial. And then those u's that we talked about, the exponentials of the little u's, are then ratios of these polynomials. So they are given by x1 over 1 plus x1. u14 is x2. So there are these five polynomials. Uh, you will you can notice that if the little x's are positive, it's good if you want the little x's to be positive because you wanted the little t's to go from minus infinity to infinity. So they're exponential to just any positive number. Uh, so if the x's are positive, these u's are between zero and one. Yes. Uh, these are the big u's. These are the uh, these are the these are the uh, uh, these are the big u's. Right. Okay. Um, but you can actually see that first of all. So now I'm just lifting. I'm just lifting what I had before. Everywhere before I had a capital U uh, in my formula for the amplitudes. If I replace that capital U with this U, then it's guaranteed that as I go off to infinity in P space, those two expressions agree. Right. Just because as I go off to infinity, it's just by construction, these are uh, landing on the tropical limit. But now this is kind of a curvy version, a nonlinear version of that uh, of that uh, of that formula. So if you now if you now take this expression, alpha prime squared integral now dt1 dt2 turns into d log x1 d log x2. And now the product of all the curves on the surface u x to the alpha prime times x. Then this is the charge point string theory. And now it really depends on alpha prime, and alpha prime is interpreted as the string length. And the limit as alpha prime goes to zero, we go back to a field theory. But again, we're not starting with a picture of points and saying, what if the points were little loops? Uh, it's somehow something more structural that was sitting there about the properties of the of the diagrams to begin with that, uh, that, that has this natural lift. But here, I should put the word string theory again in quotes because this expression makes sense for any value of the mass squared of the particle. For example, I can have a massless scalar, could live in any number of dimensions. And string theory doesn't give me this background. I want the specific number of dimensions, doesn't give me this theory of massless particles with a spike cubed interaction. So there's a specific value of the masses. When you put the mass squared equals minus one, this agrees with literally the bosonic string. Okay, uh, and you can ask what it means for the other values of the mass squared, what its physical uh, consistency properties are, et cetera. But whatever it is, it's some kind of high energy regulator of the low energy field theory amplitudes, and it's guaranteed to match what looks like field theory amplitudes at low uh, energy. But the question of what their meaning is uh, beyond these special points that literally connect to a string theory is something that, uh, that we're uh, 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 still investigate. But let me explain to you why, and then I'll, I'll make this explanation and uh, end. And, uh, at least uh, let me explain why uh, uh, why this is happening. Why is this a string theory? Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. That's just exactly what I was going to say. So you can just verify very nicely that these zeros satisfy these capital U13. Plus u24, u25 equals one. Plus this. Yep. This is what we would expect in this case. 
here all the intersection numbers are just one. Okay, so uh, so if I'm drawing one, one, three, the chords that intersected are two, four, and two, five, and they intersect once. Okay, so uh, now, uh, as I said, th this phenomenon happens for any surface. There are these views for any surface, and they uh, satisfy uh, equations like this. Um, but sorry, why does it matter as far as these integrals go? You see, there's a, there's uh, these the the defining feature of particle amplitudes is that when you encounter a pole, if one of these x's go to zero, they're supposed to factorize into the product of simpler amplitudes. The magic of string theory, uh, and one of the usual things that we talk about in the magic of string theory in textbooks, is that the same thing happens even when the string length is finite. Okay, so that uh, so even when alpha this parameter alpha prime is finite, when you go on a pole, the amplitude factorizes the product of string amplitudes, not field theory amplitudes anymore, but string amplitudes multiplied by the corresponding pole. Why does that happen here? Well, where does this integral have singularities when some x goes to zero? Why does it have a singularity there? Because in this in this form, the corresponding u is going to zero. But in the locus where the u is going to zero, all the incompatible ones are going to one. And therefore, they drop out of this equation. And what you get is a clean factorization of the amplitude into the product of the lower surfaces, even at finite alpha prime. So that's that's why these amplitudes, you would think they would do something good, even at finite alpha prime. Uh, on top of the fact that, of course, the alpha prime goes to zero, they reduce back to the ordinary uh, product amplitudes. Now, as I said, uh, yes, okay, yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, the, the, the kind of both conceptual and the practical part of the matter now is to learn how to solve for these u variables. Okay? And, uh, and one picture uh, in the case of the disk, these u's have a very simple interpretation. They're just a very particular cross ratio. So if you want to know, uh, if you want to know, if you want to know uh, a, a, a uij, the uij is just this uh, 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 cross ratio of i minus one j, ij minus one divided by these two crossing ones. So u is that particular cross ratio, and you can very simply check that the u equations are satisfied because the telescopic, uh, telescopically, the product of all the u's of the sum exactly gives me the other two terms in what's needed for the uh, Plucker relation that says that the sum of the, the that, that the, the, the obvious Plucker relation is that it is that quadrilateral. So these u's, these u equations are obviously solved on the disk. And by the way, these variables were studied by, even before string theory was called string theory in 1968, and they were studied by, they're used by Francis Brown and a number of other people in a number of, uh, of uh, settings. Uh, what's again really nice about them is they give you a really clean sort of compactification of the space. The boundaries just correspond to u's going to zero and one, and we understand what it does in a, just uh, uh, algebraically in a simple way. But once you know that this picture is true for the disk, then it's pretty obviously true for any surface by the fact that you can uniformize any surface by uh, by uh, 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 by uh, by uh, points uh, up to the identification of subgroups of SL two in the upper half plane. Uh, and if you just uh, follow your nose uh, from that uh, from that uh, from that uniform from that uniformization, um, if you take these definitions for the u variables in the upper half plane. And then just look at what the, the disk u equation looks like. But now we're identifying a lot of curves in the upper half plane with each other that are related by the action of the symmetry group. What you get are the u's downstairs on the surface, but with uh, powers that occur in, the, in, uh, in this product, which are just given by the uh, geometric intersection. Okay. So from that point of view, the fact that the u's are solvable and are associated uh, in a simple way with the hyperbolic geometry is clear. But what's pressingly needed is a concrete explicit formula. We're actually getting literally that cross ratio for any surface. That's exactly what uh, that the uh, the Fokontarov picture with products of two by two matrices and producing the SL two matrix exactly gives us in a very concrete way. And these x variables that we're talking about here are literally the uh, x variables of uh, Fock and uh, uh, Gontra. However, um, uh, literally that construction gives you the use can be used to give you the u's directly. The u's are given as rational functions, but we, if we can be left to wonder where these polynomials come from. 
Okay. And these polynomials are, are an interesting answer to a certain counting problem that's associated with those Google mapped words. Okay. So if you take the like Google mapped words, there's a very simple combinatorial problem associated with Google mapped words that exactly produces the polynomials that we are talking about. And uh, I'll make a, a final uh, a 30 second comment, uh, which I didn't have time to say. Uh, we can take these uh, integrals, we can take these integrals, and actually we have various choices for the curves that we can put here. We can put all the curves, we, we can put only the curves on the surface that don't self-intersect each other, that don't self-intersect. The curves that don't self-intersect, they have a chance to go to zero. The curves that do self-intersect, their u's can't go to zero because in the u equations, they occur in both terms because they, they intersect themselves. Okay? So somehow the ones that are relevant for the boundaries of the space are that that's one set of equations, that, that that's one set of amplitudes that you can write down. Of course, you can take the topical limit of all of this, just to talk about field theory amplitudes, and then you only want to put the, 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 the curves that don't self-intersect. And that gives you a generalization of this formula for any surface. So, so there's some concrete formula of that for the amplitudes, you know, uh, for for uh, uh, for any surface, you just have to do some work to determine these these uh, these f's of the polynomial. But interestingly, to match the string theory, on a string theory, you have to put all the curves on the surface, including the self-intersecting curves, including the closed self-intersecting curves. And you can't see in probably any detail uh, in this expression up here. But I've written down what we would get from these. Uh, literally just the formula that I wrote down. You have to do a loop integral. This is just the, the, the d log x1, d log x2 factor. And this is what I would get for the, the case of, an, of, a, of, a, of a punctured disk with two external boundary points, what we call a bubble, one loop bubble diagram in physics. So uh, there are this class of curves, those are the u variables. There are these curves that self-intersect any number of times. There's a factor associated with them. There's also uh, curves that uh, self-intersect any number of times. And here's the factor associated with that. It's interesting that for reasons I don't have time to explain, it's, it's natural and important to raise them to the power, they take self-intersect j times to raise them to the power of j squared. Uh, and then when you just follow your nodes and, and just loop integrate and shove in what these u's are, uh, you get uh, an expression which you can compare to the, you know, uh, the uh, uh, chapter eight of some uh, string theory textbook. Interestingly, from the factors involving these curves that go from boundary to boundary, we get Jacobi theta functions. And from these factors involving the closed loop that self intersect, we get dedicated theta functions. And these are the kind of hallmarks of sort of stringy things that you see at, uh, at, uh, uh, at loop level. Um, the product over closed self intersecting curves is in, in, a, in string theory language return, related to the determinant of the Laplacian on the surface. And that is a Selberg uh, zeta function uh, formula. This is a representation, an origin of that Selberg zeta function formula from these, uh, from these products of these closed self intersecting curves raised to quadratically growing powers. These quadratically growing powers have a very interesting role to play in this story. And these variables also are quadratically growing. They're quadratically growing for the very simple reason that they're related to, uh, 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 anyway, for very obvious reasons that are there in the physics. And they give you these Jacobi theta functions. These Jacobi theta functions in general are interpreted as the Green's function on the surface. And the Green's function of a bunch of charges on the surface these are the sort of two parts of what we get from a string theory computation. And the two parts are sort of naturally interpreted, but in this very regulated, tame way. It's a product of objects that are between zero and one, um, uh, these binary objects that are uh, 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 between uh, uh, zero and one in, in this way. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so again, this works for any number of dimensions. We don't know ahead of time what to put for the exponent. Uh, but there are some extra, both physical and mathematical requirements you could put on this final function uh, for, for this entire expression to have interesting only logarithmic singularities. Um, uh, some analysis, which is equivalent to analysis that was done by physicists back in the 19, early 1970s, tells you this exponent has got to be minus 24 and the number of dimensions has got to be 26. So if you want to know where the 24 and 26 of string theory comes from in this language, you, we get these expressions that make sense for any D, they do, they factorize, they do all these things. But if you want something extra, 
we want the, the new singularities uh, associated with shrinking the hole to have a simple logarithmic form um, that uh, fixes the things that we normally think of as shrink theory, as well as the massless graviton and all the rest of that type of stuff. All right, um, I think I'll end it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So for time being, probably we just take one quick question from the audience, maybe. So if I understand correctly, this U variables you have, if you do at least a finite type case, uh, this will be up to some change of variable, exactly the same things as appeared in the zomologic of cycle, uh, in the zomologic of periodicity conjecture, right? Which was kind of original. And it also had a physical motivation, this Betsy and that's and so on. How is that physical motivation is related to your- I don't know, very, very, very good question. I don't know. I mean, here, here are the sort of motivation when something goes from zero to one, uh, the way I describe the motivation is ultimately that we have this all the time when we think in terms of the Schwinger parameters. So we think about the exponentials of length uh, are, are things that, that, that naturally give us these variables that go from zero to one. The exponential of minus something that's positive, positive length. So we get the variables that go from, uh, see, we get these binary variables. So that's the kind of purpose here. You think of what these U's are, 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 are variables that are there in the entire space, but as we go to extremes, um, uh, uh, which corresponds to going to a particular boundary uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the moduli space. Only some of the U's are relevant, and uh, that corresponds to those corresponding Schwinger parameters becoming long, and that's the. Okay, let's thank Nima again. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it'll just, just convention, but uh, yeah. Hi there, nice to see you.